And uh, how many have people like that in their life that have gone and stayed in that direction? Aren't you glad you gave your heart to Jesus? I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm saved. I said, I'm glad I'm saved. I said, I'm glad I'm saved. Are you glad you're saved? Can you give God praise for being saved here today? I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. Hallelujah. Amen. And I want to minister in Jesus' name on what we have been doing. I think it's important, and I, I don't know what direction. I always, I, when I come, I come here ready, and I'm ready to give whatever the Holy Spirit wants. But I, I have done my part to study and, and to uh, seek the Lord, and it could go any way because I'm just that, at that point in my life where I'm ready to do that. And I'm excited about what God's wanting us to see here because it's time to grow in the things of God. It's time to grow up. And if you're new here today and if this is all new to you, just hold on. Don't give up. Don't get all excited. Don't give, uh, give in to the things and the pressures of the world. Don't give up to the things. Well, I don't understand this stuff. I don't know about this stuff. Let me just tell you something. We're talking about God. What better person can you hang on to? What better thing can you latch on to? We're talking about the Word of God. What would you have to guess about that? What would you want to turn away about that? That would be ignorant. I mean, because God is God. And he knows everything. And he's all-powerful. And I want you to know you have an opportunity today to go farther into the things of God and develop your life. I don't care what kind of situation you are in. Thank God you have God in your situation. I've seen many people that don't have God in their situation, and they die without God. They have problems without God. They have marital situations without God. They have financial issues without God. And there is no hope without God. And let me just tell you something. Even when all hell lets loose, God lets all heaven come down. Hallelujah. The Bible teaches us when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against it. And so you need to learn how to stand firm in the things of God. Well, I don't know how to yet, Pastor. Well, that's why we're here. That's why we're here to teach. And I want to minister today on three stages of growth. Three stages of growth. I want to start this in the next couple of weeks here. Father God, I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you better. I thank you for the eyes of these people's understanding that they may know and understand perfectly, simply, the, Lord Father, the things of you. I thank you, Lord, that you give my words. I give my words to you, Lord, and my mouth to you, my heart to you, my mind to you, so that I may speak precisely into the heart, piercing their hearts, Lord, with the word of God. I thank you, Father, that I'll find uh, a residence there and change and transform them into greater, greater things and opportunities in their life. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. In our last message last week, we looked at how man was created by God, and he was created, and God breathed into him the breath of life, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. In that instant, that clay figure came alive, and the Spirit of God came alive inside of him. Unfortunately, as you know, and we all did, man sinned. And by disobeying God, man was thrust into what is known as deadness. His spirit became dead. Sin actually brought separation. Sin brought spiritual and physical death as well to all mankind. Our sin separated us from God. God didn't separate us from himself. Because of our sin, we separated from God. You see, this is not a God-forsaken world. This is a world where man has forsaken God. We turned away. We turned away. And that's why we are in the condition we're in. That's why there's such turmoil. This is why mankind without Christ lives the way they do. They're under the control of the God of this world, who is that this time Satan, the spirit that now works in those who continually disobey God's word, God's leading, God's power, God's stuff. And because of that, they are under his control. They don't even realize it. So when you talk to these people, don't be condescending. Don't be condemning. Be as loving as you could because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts this year with them. And as we do, God will break the heart of those people. And we're believing that many people were coming to Christ 
very soon in Jesus' name. Maybe even in this service today, I believe. And the terrible thing and the terrible news about this is that those who die in the state that I just talked about and have not given their life to Jesus Christ and repented of their sins, that means they forsake their sins. They say, no, even though at the time they might have a time, problem trying to handle that, they say no to sin. These kind of people, if they have not repented, unfortunately, will spend eternity in a place called hell. Is there a little place, Pastor? Absolutely. Why? How do you know? Well, I just believe the Bible. The Bible talks about it. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. God wants you to know there is a place like that. There is also a heaven. Hell was not created for you. Hell was, hell was created for Satan and his followers. And unfortunately, there's people that are blinded by the enemy today who are following the wrong dude. And we need to be out there with a gospel message and tell them about Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because they are blind. The Bible teaches us that the God of this world has blinded them. When you're blind, you can't see. When you can't see, you're walking in darkness. And when you walk in darkness, you stumble and fall. And there's a lot of people there that don't have the light that you have. That's why, brothers and sisters of the Lord, you need to go forth into all your world and minister the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ to them. To all. Don't be afraid. The worst thing that they can say is, I don't want to hear it. And if they're of any kind of friend to you, they'll still be a friend. And if they're not, then you haven't lost anything anyway. That got a big amen. You see, the good news is that God has a remedy for all this. You know John 3, 16. I don't have to quote it for you. God loves us. Gave a son. You don't have to go to hell. You choose to. You choose to go to heaven. You choose to live the way you want. God has given you a free will and will not violate that. Will not inhibit or stop that either. You can go out right after the service and rob a bank, which I do not advise. But you have the free will to do that. And then you have the free will to go to jail. Say it's right. Man must be called, what is called then born again or regenerated. I like that word regenerated. It's a neater word. It's apologinia. And what it means to be Genesis again. Genesis again. And what it means is we have the second opportunity to go back to the original state in which we were created and have a new beginning, be born again into the spirit realm. Now, that's this. Now, that means this. So if you don't know, maybe some of you need to rehash this. And for those of you who do know, then learn it again so when you talk to somebody about it, you'll know how to say it again. Because by this time, you ought to be teachers and disciplers and ministers of the gospel, not just sit there and do nothing. A do-nothing Christian gets nothing, goes, does nothing, has nothing. And will not be a blessing to the church. I mean, people out there, I've seen them, and they're sick and tired of the church. Well, my God, why don't they give up work then? Why don't they give up eating? Why don't they give up relationship? Why don't they give up that? Because they, over, they look at that as more important than the things of God. Well, you have problems in church? Most definitely. Look to the person next to you. They're causing problems right now that's looking at you. Come on now. There's going to be problems everywhere you go. But I don't see anybody giving up eating here. I don't see anybody giving up buying clothes. Thank God for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I don't see anybody out there buying $10,000 beds. But if you want to donate to me, I would thank you for it. Amen. Because <laughs> that was really a cool bed. Hallelujah. The person must accept the finished work of Jesus Christ. See, it's not based on you. It's based on him. Just like Adam, it wasn't our fault necessarily, but it is our fault because of him. The second Adam did some work as well. He finished it and did it right. He came. He lived, he died, he conquered sin and death, went to hell itself, 
went to hell in self. Now, in hell, there, and I, this is another message, but I'm going to teach this for someone here that may to know this. In hell, that's where Jesus was born again. That's where he's born again. It's begotten from the dead doesn't mean he just rose from the dead. Begotten from the dead means he was born again in hell. How could Jesus have been born again in hell? Because he became a man and took on sin, and the sin had to had a have been paid for by, by an individual. Jesus went to hell for us, and in hell, this day, Jesus said, the Father said, I have begotten thee. He was raised from the dead. I said he was raised from the dead. And not only was he physically coming alive, but he was spiritually now alive. He's the first begotten from the dead, the firstborn. And you are the second, the third, the hundredth, the millionth one thereafter. Aren't you glad you're born again here today? But it's based upon the finished work of Jesus. It's based upon what he did. Your trust is in God. And therefore, my trust, I trust in him with all my heart. I do not lean to my understanding. In all my ways, I acknowledge him, and he directs my path. He's the one that helps me. Now, because of that, I've become a new person. Aren't you glad you're a new person here today? Hallelujah. Before Christ came into your heart, you were spiritually dead. I remember those days. How many remember those days when you were spiritually dead? Hallelujah. And when you were spiritually dead, you just don't have no life in you. You're just like, you can actually see it in the eyes of people. You ever looked in a person's eyes and they're just dead? I've seen it many times. You know, but once you become born again, you become a new creation. Isn't that wonderful? A new person. I'm new. What an opportunity it has. How many remember the day they became new? Hallelujah. For some of you, it was just last week. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. Hallelujah. This is the beginning of your journey, though. There's more to it. Matter of fact, this is just the preparatory stages of what yet is to come. We're going to spend eternity with God if you're born again. And that means you're going to continually grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. And you'll never end that. You'll have... Someday we'll have class 9,099 and still advancing in the things of God. What class are you? Well, I'm only in 9,000. It doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to bring about to you is that we're going to continually grow in the things of God. Why? God is eternal. God is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all-present. So there's never an end and we'll never be bored when we go to heaven. Heaven is not a boring place like some... Some people think, and some people that don't know God, they think they're going to party in hell. You're not going to party in hell. You're going to be in spiritual death forever. There aren't going to be any people around there to hang out and pass you joy. Come on now. They're going to be eternally separated from God. Misery and doom. I don't want to go there. How many want to go to heaven here today? Let me see your hands. Hallelujah. Thank God we're going. So thank God we're going. The rapture of the church can come place today. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. That would be wonderful. Hallelujah. We can go home in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. But this is the beginning of your life, your spirit. Put your hand on your, on your chest right there. Your spirit, man, is alive now. What are you going to do about it? What have you been doing about it? And why are you in the condition you are right now if it's not that hot? It's important for you to take responsibility for your spirit man. That's you. You see, I can't do that for you. I can teach you the word of God, but you have to do it. It's the beginning here. Hallelujah. And here's what it's going to take. I, I, I added another thing. I said three things last week, but it's God, Holy Spirit showed me one more thing. There has to be a godly desire. You got to have to want this stuff. I, I'll look you right in the face, and I'm going to tell you straight up. If you don't want it, you won't get it. My bishop just sent, mentioned something this, this past week to me, and I heard some of you already heard me say it, but I'm going to say it again. He said, if you're hungry enough, physically, you'll eat bugs. If you're thirsty enough, physically, you'll drink from a creek. How hungry are you? That's why when you go to other countries, when they don't have all the stuff that we have, all the Internet, all the television, all the activities, all the pleasures that we have, thank God, in America, 
All they have is Jesus. And they're hungry. Hunger will bring you to a greater depth than you've ever been. But there has to be a godly desire. And then it moves on to discipline. That means that you have to force yourself to do what you wouldn't want to do. Isn't it amazing that when you plant a garden, the weeds just grow, but you have to nurture the good plants for them to grow. So it is in the spirit. You have to discipline your body because you have to discipline your spirit. You have to discipline your mind because it just doesn't happen. As you know, it just doesn't happen. It has to be disciplined, and then it has to be dedication. That's a daily thing. That has to be dedicated to this. There's going to be time. And let me just tell you something. You are already doing that with your jobs. It's amazing to me how people are dedicated to their jobs. Thank God that you are, and you should be. But it takes the same dedication that it takes with your work, that it takes to develop your spirit man, that it takes to develop your mental facilities, that it takes to eat right and do everything. It's the same dedication. All you need to do is apply it in those areas. And then you also need to become committed. That means there has to be a lifestyle change. There has to be. I am so excited about my life because I have finally learned how to do something in this. And I think it's important. It doesn't matter what church you go to or the size of the church or the size of anything else. All that matters is if you want it with all your heart, you can get it. You can get it. doesn't matter where you are. You can get it. You, you, some of you need to finish your degree. How? Have a God desire. Have discipline. Have dedication. Have commitment. Some of you need to grow in the spirit more, and you definitely do. Have a God desire. Have discipline. Have dedication and commit it to your life. Make it a lifestyle change. Hallelujah. How many agree to that? Say amen. I'm saying it enough times till it gets in. And now, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, how many have accepted Jesus Christ? Raise your hand like you know it and you're happy about it. Hallelujah. Look around. Hallelujah. And see who doesn't so you can pray with them after service. Amen. If you have accepted Christ and taken the steps necessary for spiritual growth, you need to do something about it. It's your responsibility. God's not going to do this for you. God is not going to do this for you. Aren't you tired of just being a John 3, 16, 23rd Psalm Christian? Now, that's wonderful, but that's about the mentality of many people. They just know John 3, 16, they know God loves them, and they know the 23rd Psalm, and that's about all they do in their whole life. Now, that's great, but how many know there's more to it than that? There's a lot more to it. Here's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 8 and verse 11 through 15. Paul the Apostle says, Therefore he says, that's the scripture or for the Lord, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts, everybody say gifts, to men. And he, he himself gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of you, the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till... We all come to the unity of the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect, say perfect man, perfect man, to the measure of the same stature, the fullness of Christ, that you should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man trying to get you to side with them and the cunning craftiness and of deceitful plotting. But speak the truth in love. Listen to this may grow up, may grow up in all things in, unto him or into him who is the head, even Christ. God wants you to know, and the Apostle Paul understood this, that not everybody in a church is grown up. Now, that is not demeaning. That is not in any way trying to be that someone else is better than you. It's just quite evident that when it's in a body or in a family, there are people at different stages. And I think it's important for you to understand here today that in any, any church there are people at, any, uh, at several stages of growth. And that we need to be mature about this and grow and understand. That's why Paul said, speak the truth in love, may grow up. And he says, till we all come into the unity of faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man. 
Now, when Paul said perfect, he doesn't mean that you'll never make a mistake. He meant simply that when we reach full maturity, full maturity, you know, in other words, you need to grow spiritually. You can't stay where you are. Some of you have, have stagnated, and you really have not grown for a while. You know, if anything, it, it's abnormal to stay the same. It is. When we talk about the babyhood stage, it would be abnormal for a baby to remain a baby. God forbid. Imagine having a 25-year-old guy with diapers on living at home. That would be disgusting. That would be disgusting. But at the end of the church, there are people like that. Nothing wrong with being a baby, but not that long. Hallelujah. I said not that long. Hallelujah. You need to reach maturity. What do I mean by maturity? That we were, and we're able to have a knowledge of the word of God. That we know the word of God. We know what it says. We know what God's doing. We, we have our personal walk developed in the things of God that we're actually doing it. We're not just going home and coming to church on Sunday. And that's about the extent of our walk. We're actually activated in the things of God on a weekly basis in our job, at home, and wherever we go. We develop the things of God. We're aware and practicing all that God has. We're disciplers. We're out to reach people. We're actually doing the stuff. You see, you have been called into the family of God. And God wants you to do his work. Jesus even said, I must be about my father's business. Is this a business? The best one in the world. The best thing in the world. It's God's business, and we need to enhance the kingdom. God has put a valuable investment in this kingdom. He gave a son. And he expects a return. As anybody that puts investment in something expects a return. And God will look someday at the CEO meeting of heaven and see what kind of return you have given to him. Some of you have hid your talents. Hello. Some of you are going to double it. How many people will be like those people that double the things of God in their life in Jesus' name? Hallelujah. How many want to grow in the Lord? Let me see your hands. How many really want to grow in the Lord? Let me see your hands. Hallelujah. The Bible teaches, though, that there is a striking similarity between spiritual development and physical development. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm going to buckle up. My wife told me that my thing is okay. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There are stages of growth, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm working out, though. Say amen. There are definitely stages of growth in your spiritual life that parallel your physical life. These are some of the stages. There's a babyhood stage. There's a childhood stage, and there's a manhood stage, adulthood. I want to take this morning the time to talk about the babyhood stage because sometimes as, as churches we overlook this, and we actually think, chronologically that because a person has been a Christian for a long time that they're now mature that's not true it's not a chronological thing it's a, a it's a maturity thing it's a development thing I mean you can be a baby I know people that are 40 50 years old that are act like babies how many know people like that so I want to look at some things here at the babyhood stage, and I want you to understand this. This is just going to be a, a little bit teaching. We'll have the Holy Spirit move, whatever, in a few minutes here, whatever God wants to do. But you need to understand this so we know how to react and work with people that are at this stage. Maybe you're here, and you're like that. So look what the Word says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, the Apostle Paul addresses the Corinthian church who had all the gifts of the Spirit in operation. But not a single one of them would have been qualified for ministry because they're all babes. And he says, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as carnal, even as babes in Christ. So he looked at the church and he saw that, that they were good people, but they were still in that babyhood stage and they needed to develop in their walk with God. Then Peter, the apostle Peter, says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, he says, as newborn babes... As newborn babes, desire and go after with all your heart the sincere milk of the word 
that you may grow thereby. No one in the church comes in full grown. No one in the church comes in as a fully mature person. They come in as babies. And babies are messy. How many know what I'm talking about? You just, some of you who had babies, I know you, we see your pictures on Facebook all the time. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. But babies are messy. How many appreciate the babies they have in Jesus' name? Cute. Hallelujah. And they need others to take care of them. They can't take care of themselves. Matter of fact, we who are more mature in the church can't expect somebody who just gives their heart this past Sunday to act like somebody that's mature. We can't expect that. How many remember when they first got saved? My, my, my goodness, it took me at least two months to quit, quit swearing. Now, I'm not encouraging you to swear, but I was like a sailor back then, and I did a lot of cussing. And I did, it took me around two months. I was happy on days where I only swear, swore maybe 20 times. I was happy. I said, man, I'm doing good. You know, and, and I, luckily I had people around me that loved me enough. Hallelujah. <laughs> I remember Jane when she first testified one day, and she just got up and, and said, the devil has been beep, 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 beeping to me. And everybody looked at her, and we knew that she just gave her heart to the Lord. Remember that, Jane? It was the funniest thing. Everybody was, <gasps> she's cursing while she's testifying. The funniest thing I ever saw in my life. Hallelujah. <laughs> it is funny. Hallelujah. In the right manner. In the right way. Because she was sincere. She didn't know. She didn't know. She didn't know that was, you don't supposed to talk like that in church. <laughs> you, don't like, you don't need to talk like that anywhere. But it is funny. Hallelujah. When you see it. And you, and you who are mature know what I'm talking about. Amen. You know, when you're a babe in Christ, you have problems, wrong ideas, wrong habits. I did. When I first got, I'm going to be real honest with you. I didn't think there was anything wrong with, uh, with sex outside of marriage when I got married, uh, when I got saved. And then somebody come to me and said, somebody get me a tissue quick. Thank you, Jesus. That made me sweat. <laughs> I never forget when somebody came up to me and said, John, you can't have sex before marriage when you're a Christian. I, I said, oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> I was really serious. You know, there's a lot of people that have wrong. They just don't know. And so you don't know, and so it's important to, to grow in the things of the Lord. You just don't know. I mean, it, when you come to, I was excited about God, but I didn't know all that stuff. You mean I had to get rid of all my rock and roll? I remember when I got all of my ro rid of all of my rock and roll albums. I had about a stack like that. And I really got saved and turned on to the Lord. And I'm, I, I was really hyper in the Lord. I was really going at it. So somebody said, well, you need to get rid of all that rock and roll. I wish I would have kept it and sold it, but that's okay. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> they were all classic rock. Amen. And I'll never forget, I got, a, I got out to the garbage can, and I got some gasoline. You, got out, you have to watch how much gasoline you use. Say amen. It can be very dangerous. And I, I literally thought that while I was burning these, these albums, how many remember albums, that I would hear demons cry. So I'm throwing the records in and the Ouija board. How many remember the Ouija board? Anybody did that stuff? I did that stuff. Come on. You know, up table, up table, all kind of stupid stuff like idiots that seek after the wrong thing. You didn't know. We used to have seances in our house. We did. We, we're good Catholics. <laughs> we're just good Catholics. We're just kind of calling on another spirit. We needed help. Did the tea leaves and all that kind of stupid stuff. You know, any, there's, there's some stupid stuff out there. Aren't you glad you live in the South and know better? You probably have never had that problem. That's true. It's probably true because you've been raised, pretty much most of the people, you go to jail around here and everybody knows the scripture. They've been in church. We didn't know anything. We just went to church. And sometimes we didn't even do that. But what I'm telling you is that, that babies in Christ are messy. 
They don't know. They, how could they know? They never studied it. Unless they were in the church all their life and they never really committed their life, that's a different story. And all babies like to do is eat. Their favorite food is milk. And boy, do they like the milk. How many know they like the milk? How many know babies like milk? And, I, and you can't expect them to eat solid food. Matter of fact, we know better. You can't feed a little baby a steak. They don't even have teeth. Now when you get older, you really wish you did have teeth. Amen. So you can eat that steak. You might gum it to death, but that's about all you can get. Or put it in a blender, put a little milk on it, and drink it. Say amen. <laughs> yeah, well, you try it. You'll like it. Steak shake. I wonder about myself sometimes. <laughs> I'm just picturing it now in my mind. Just give me a little time here. <laughs> Amen. Milk is what you need to grow. And if you feed a baby milk, guess what? They will grow. A lot of times you have to understand, a lot of pastors think, well, I just need to stay on the milk with the church. And they've, doing it, doing, uh, they've been doing it for 20 years, and you see the Christians in the church, and they're still not growing. They haven't been doing anything. We need to give milk, but we need to also train them up. Hallelujah. But if you have milk, you'll grow, because the Bible says you'll grow if you have milk, and it's important. They'll get on some solid food. It takes time. You know, the difference between milk and solid food is very simple. The basics of the Word of God, like laying on a hands, the, the first initial response, getting saved, it's all kind of surface, but the meat, you get deeper into the details of it and the understanding of how to apply the things. That's all. That's the meat of the Word of God. So you can get on any subject, whatever matter, salvation to healing to, to any subject, you can go from milk to meat by the way of depthness, how deep in the understanding of it, the intricate details, the application and the uh, applying it of it into your life. You all here today? Hallelujah. So we need to understand. Here's a neat thing about babies, too. Uh, the nice thing about them is that they don't have a past. They're newly born. When you're newly born, you don't have, you don't have a past. So you can have been as mean as a snake and as bad as the devil before or been the worst person ever. How many were like that before? Anybody like that? Only a few of you. All the rest of you were very nice sinners. Hallelujah. Daryl, you were mean. I can't ever imagine you being mean. Tell us, Pam. Tell us all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. I mean, we were mean. I was mean. You were probably mean. We cussed. We stole. We did this. At least I did. Hallelujah. But no matter how, how bad you were before, it doesn't matter how bad you, when you come to Jesus Christ, you become a new person. You have a new start. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for a new start in Jesus. I'm thankful for a new beginning. The Bible even says it this way in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in two translations. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are, are passed away. They died. Behold, all things are become new. Another translation, God's News of the World, it says this, whoever is a believer in Christ is a new creation. The old way of living has disappeared. The new way of living has come into existence. We're new. And aren't you thankful that you are new here today? Say amen. Let's give God praise for, for doing that in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, there are three things to be aware of when you're in this baby stage. Number one is that there... The first thing is you're innocent. I like cute things. How many like cute little babies? And you look at a baby and they're, and they're cute and you take all those pictures and put them on Facebook every day. Thank you, Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with that. Hey, Amen. But they're cute. They're innocent. And, and, they're, and they're wonderful. They're, they're, it's, it's so nice. Never lose your innocence as a Christian. Just never lose that at all. There, there's nothing more wonderful to see when a person in Christ is, is, has a teachable spirit who is 
on fire for God. They want more, and they're hungry. And you see them hungry. I'll tell you right now, yesterday when we went to Golden Corral, I saw a whole bunch of hungry guys for Jesus. There's nothing more wonderful to see a babe in Christ who is innocent and wants more of God. Hallelujah. Then there's, there's sometimes an element of ignorance. There's innocence, and then sometimes there's ignorance in children and babes. Now, ignorance doesn't mean stupid. Ignorance simply means that they don't know yet. And you ever saw a child they don't know yet? A lot of times, naturally, newborn babes, as they grow a little bit, they have the tendency to find things on the floor, and the first thing they do with it is what? Stick it in their mouth. Anything. I mean, you've got to really work at getting the house clean because they'll eat it all. They'll eat everything. They'll find a penny, and the first thing they do with a penny is stick it in their mouth. They'll find dog doo-doo. Come on now. Stick that in their mouth. Didn't I make you excited about that right now in Jesus' name? They find anything, they just stick it in their mouth. <laughs> Can you pray for me right now? Hallelujah in Jesus' name. <laughs> but they just stick it in their mouth. And they stick these things in their mouth, and they know it really are not a what. What I'm getting at is simple. The same thing is true spiritually speaking. Let's mean, let me just say this. If you've started your walk in the Lord, be careful what goes into your mouth. Be careful what goes into your mouth and to your heart. I've seen a lot of people, unfortunately, as babes in Christ, take some poisonous doctrine. And they started to digest it by hanging out with the wrong crowd. They've been taught wrong things. You need to watch what you eat. You need to be careful what you eat. And a lot of people I've known who started off in the Lord got off into religious things. They got off in, in things that made them look goofy, sound goofy, become goofy. They got off into religion. Some of them, in all honesty, got off into cults. And even I had one time a girl from our church go and marry. And I love Mormon people, but they're not right with God. And they married a Mormon person. I would say to her, why do you want to go? Well, they believe in God. They believe in the wrong thing about God. And she went off and married a person in that. And now probably in the Mormon church, or not even a Christian at all. And there's other people that end up just giving their life and not even following the Lord anymore. They start hanging out with people again from their past. And the first thing they do, they start going back into their stuff. How many know what I'm talking about? If you're here today, don't go backwards. Go forwards into the things of God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. So be careful what you eat spiritually. It could kill you. I mean, if you, God forbid, ate poison and it's laying out and the little baby sucks down poison or something like that, that baby can die. So it's important here. What's important for you then is to be in a good church like this that teaches the Bible and has loving people of God that are around you that want to help you grow in the things of God. Can you say amen? Let's give God praise for that. Hallelujah. So be careful. Babies also become irritable. You'll see this in the church a lot. I'm not saying this con in a condescending way. I'm going to say babies are easily spoiled. When they come, they become spoiled, and, they, and when they become spoiled, they get a little bit irritable at times. You see this in the church. They become easily annoyed and even angry. You see that a lot in every church. How many know what I'm talking about? It indicates a level of growth. When you see this a lot in the church, it tells you what phase you're acting like. It's sure quiet in this church. When you see a lot of anger happening, there's no need to be angry. You work it out. You work it through. When you get angry, you're not going to act right. And it just indicates that something's not right. Unfortunately, at times you'll even see where the baby is controlling the parent. We see that in the natural. The remedy to that is have a couple more babies.
How many know what I'm talking about? This went over the heads of those who have their first one. Let's have a couple more. <laughs> Say here. Come on. All right. Babies, we need to understand here, they get angry sometimes. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to understand that's going to happen. They get irritable. Nothing wrong. We're not trying to be mean. We can be able to handle that. Say amen. Are we all here today? Say amen. Listen, if you're in this stage, watch your attitude. Watch what you do. Watch what you say. Be, a, be conscious that now I'm, I'm in something new here. This is kind of different. I want to be open to what God has for me. I want to learn. And you around who are more mature, be an example. Start understanding that people are watching you. They're watching how you respond. They're watching how you talk. They're watching where you're going, okay? It's so interesting that in church, people tend to hang out with the people that are at their level. You understand what I just said? Babies like to hang out with other babies. There's nothing wrong with, with fellowship. But if you want to grow, you need to hang out with some people that are more mature, too. Well, they're not exciting, Pastor John. They don't like to go to the places I like. Well, good. Good. Come on. It's time to give up some of those places that you've been going to because some of it's not good. Well, so-and-so is doing it. So, why don't you follow somebody that's following the Lord? And I'm not saying you can't have fun. Matter of fact, you can have more fun doing the things of God than the things of the devil. And it's time to give up some of the places that you've been going to I've given my heart to Jesus. I don't go there anymore. And if I do go, I go to witness as the Lord leads. You mean, Pastor John, I need to give up some of the places I've gone to? If they're not godly, sure do. You know, we're living in a PC world. Everybody's politically correct. And no one takes responsibility for standing up for anything anymore. Amen. Oh, that's okay. We got the new generation. The, what generation do we call the, no offense, the younger generation. They're open, to, they're open to everything, and nothing's wrong. Nothing is wrong. Homosexuality well, is wrong, and, and they don't think that's wrong, and everything else. They just don't have no, we shouldn't be judging anybody. We're not trying to judge. We're trying to follow. Follow God. You all here today? And because of that, you'll be irritated sometimes. You take away a bottle from a little baby after a while and watch what happens. They'll cry and, and shout and scream and, and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'll tell you right now, they'll get mad. When you start seeing that in your life, you need to step back and say, why am I becoming angry? Why am I becoming irritated? Why am I doing this? It could be that I'm not doing the right thing. Analyze yourself in the things of God. And those around you have enough love to go to that person if you have a relationship with them, if you have a relationship with them, and kindly say, did you realize that these, you're doing this in your life? I don't know. If, I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm trying to tell you because I love you. You need to watch what you're doing. Did you ever have somebody come to you enough, oh, boy, this is good. And you know that that person been, you know, we don't want to say, I don't want to say anything. It's not my place to say anything. Well, sure, you should have a relationship with, with the person first. You just can't go into somebody's life and start condemning them. I mean, not in any way condemning, you know, to do it. You know, if I were to go up to you and I were to ask you today, and I didn't know you, how's your liver doing? You would look at me like, who are you to ask me about my liver? But if I was your doctor and you had some liver conditions and I came into the room and I said, hello, Mr. George, how are you doing? Uh, by the way, how is your liver doing today? Oh, fine, doctor. I appreciate you asking. You have to have the opportunity there. You have to have a relationship to speak into somebody's life. You're all here today. Hallelujah. What I'm telling you to do is you're going to have to have relationships with people that are new coming to Christ. 
and you have to build them. Some of you who are mature in the Lord, you're bored in the things of God because you're not doing what God says. You're supposed to be discipling. It's not my job alone. It's not my job to go disciple. I do disciple. I love the disciple. But it's your job now as a mature person in Christ to be a disciple of Jesus. What does that mean, Pastor John? That means I'm called to do something. You are called to work for the Lord. Well, Pastor, I don't know enough. My goodness, why not? You've been in the church long enough. It's time to do something. I, I am meddling. That's okay. Hallelujah. You know, these people need help. How are we going to grow and have a move of God if we don't take responsibility for what we're supposed to do? How? You can't grow a church with babies. Thank God for babies. Thank God for newborn people. We want that all the time. But it should be a continual flow of this. A continual thing. We need to mature them. And if you're here today and you're a baby in Christ, we are not putting you down. Everybody starts as a baby. But some of you think you're mature and you're really not. You know why? You're not doing anything. If you were mature, you'd be doing something. Is it just quiet in here because I'm preaching bad? Listen, let me just tell you something. If you're not doing anything, and I believe you should, most Christians in America, all they do is go to church, and that's the extent of their walk with God. Where is that in the Bible? God wants you to be a workman for him. A workman. Doing the work of God. I must be about the Father's business. How do we do the works of God? The disciples asked Jesus one day, how do you work the works of God? Jesus turned around and said to them, believe on me. That is the works of God. What did he say? What was he meaning? He said, believe me enough to do it. Believe me enough to practice what I'm telling you. That's the work of God. Believe me, and now go do it. So it's time for you who are more mature to believe God and just go help these people. Help those who are yet in the babyhood state. Help each other because you really don't know where a person is. Matter of fact, I have found out this to be true. And I have discipled probably tons of people right now in my life. You, you really wouldn't believe how little people really know until you sit down and talk with them. You really don't know how little people know until you sit down and talk with them. That's the truth. You start talking to them, and you start getting their theology out of them. You start talking. To, what do you think about this? Well, I, you know, I don't know. And you know why that happens? Hello? You who think you're mature, you have not spent the time to mature yourself enough. Now, that sounds condescending, and I do not want to in any way come across that way. But it is true. It is true. You'll see people that think they know, and they're proud of it. They'll sit in church. Well, I've been here 25 years, and I know about the things of God. Hallelujah. And then you all start pressing them a little bit. Well, I didn't know that. Are you doing that? No. No. It's time you do it. And you who are just coming to Christ, don't follow that example. Don't you dare follow that example. Follow God. Follow the ones that are excited. Follow the ones that are doing something. I love Joshua. Joshua is probably the most ex excited youth pastor we ever had. He really is. Stand up, Joshua. Let's give him a hand because he is a blessing. You are. Go ahead, sit down. He knows me yesterday. He says he got so excited from the men's group, he went outside and ministered for four more hours to people. Four more hours. Why did he do that? Oh, because he's a youth pastor. No. He's excited about Jesus. 
He's excited about Jesus. How excited are you about Jesus? Hallelujah. How, many, how excited are you about Jesus here today? I said, how excited are you? There's people around you right now. I mean, let me just say something. Some of you are dry in the things of God. Well, nothing's happening in my life. This church is just not cutting it for me anymore. I'm not learning anything. Well, why don't you get off your duffy and start doing something for the Lord? Why don't you get up and start witnessing? Why don't you get up and start discipling? Why don't you get up and start praying? Why don't you get up and start doing the things of God? I'm tired of you trying to tell a church that it's not doing enough. God's telling you, get off your seat. Get up and do something for God and get excited about what he's doing for your life. Amen. Amen. Now, that's good preaching whether you like it or not. Hallelujah. In closing here, come on up, guys. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God for spring has come and it's hot. Time for AC, active Christianity. <laughs> Four things to do as a new believer and even at any level of Christ. There's four things you need to do. Number one, read and study your Bible every day. I can tell when somebody doesn't read and study their Bible every day. You know how? Just ask yourself, what did the Lord tell me today? When you go, nothing. That means you've done nothing. So next time I ask you, get ready. You ask some other people. Watch. Just test that. Go ask to ask, what is the Lord speaking to you? If it's nothing, that means you spend no time with him. Number two, pray and talk with God every day. Even during the day. Number three, come to church regularly. This is simple. Come to church regularly. Number four, get involved in a small group for fellowship. I love Mark. Mark has brought a new flavor to our church. He has a nice young group on Wednesday nights at his house. As a pastor, I, I said, that's fine. Whether I'd rather see him come to a group than not come anywhere at all. Hallelujah. Get involved in a small group. Get involved. Then talk to others. Number, number six, or number five, talk to others about Christ and invite them. You'll be amazed. How many know somebody that's not saved right now? Let me see your hands. How many know that? Come on, raise your hands. Chris, you know anybody that's not a Christian around here? Well, you're going to have to find some. I'll help you, okay? Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Raise your hand right now. Come on, if you know somebody. Father, we believe that you're going to lead us to those people. You're going to help us. Lord, we left our first love sometimes, Lord God. We're not after you like we used to be. Lord, help us to get back in love with you. In love with you. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to say, Pastor John, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Christian. I really don't have God in my heart like you're telling me. I really want that in my life. I've, been, I've heard about this. I've even been in church before, and I've heard the message, but I've never really, really could.